Okay. So the most interesting and ultimately the most influential of these uh, individual colonial meetings did take place in Virginia at the Virginia House of Burgesses. Now one of the things that the Intolerable Acts led to was the closure of all the parliamentary buildings. So this actually took place in a small church which you can still visit. Uh, it's called St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia. And I may be sometime soon, either tomorrow or when we come back, I will show you a picture of it. And I want you, no, it's a small church at the time. Uh, there were about 120 people crammed into this little tiny church in March of 1773. And I would like to, you to imagine now that you are among those 120 people, which included me. Seriously, there was a Colonel Andrew Lewis there, a hero from the... He was, a, he was a, somebody who'd fought alongside George Washington uh, in the French and Indian War and would later fight in the Revolutionary War, Colonel Andrew Lewis. I'm not making this up. And you go to, somewhere in Virginia, there is a Colonel Andrew Lewis Highway. So that's just kind of nice. But 120 people there, but uh, more notably, people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were in the room. So this is pretty serious stuff. The meeting was going on, okay, we don't talk now at all. Meeting was going on, trying to figure out what the Virginians would do. Uh, so imagining this our little church hall. Uh, the president of the Congress, Peyton Randolph, was seated in the bishop's chair. Let's imagine him up there. And the debate had been going on for two days. And the people who were opposed to war had just finished their arguments. Now we can imagine, let's imagine them sitting over there. Hi. And they had two very good reasons for not going to war. There are two reasons for not going to war. Well, one, well, we can still hope for a peaceful resolution. England's still listening to us. They're still receiving all these petitions. Uh, the uh, First Continental Congress had sent a letter over to George III complaining about things, and that hadn't made things any worse. So they still hoped for a peaceful resolution that England and uh, the colonies could reconcile. So it was just too soon to go and fight a war. So that was their first reason. Their second reason was, if we choose to go to, get, go to, if we choose to, go to war, we will get creamed. We don't stand a chance. We're simply too weak to stand up to the most powerful country in the world, which England was at the time. It had the best soldiers, the best, best trained soldiers, the best navy uh, in the world. They out, uh, England outnumbered uh, America in population six to one, and the anti-war people said, we're, we're, we're doomed. We don't stand a chance, so we really shouldn't uh, try to fight the war. Now Patrick Henry, whose pew, because it was his church, I mean in the sense that it was his parish church, his pew was over on that side and he'd been listening for two days to all this and he barely said a word. And at the end of the debate, at, when these guys had sat down, he got up and made the final closing argument to all the delegates, in other words you, trying to convince him of his opinion. And this is what he said. No man thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism, as well as abilities, of the very worthy gentlemen who have just addressed the house. But different men often see the same subject in different lights. And therefore, I hope it will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if, entertaining as I do, opinions of a character very opposite to theirs, I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the house is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. And in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. 
It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offence? I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country and of an act of disloyalty toward the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the number of those who, having eyes see not and having ears hear not the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth. To know the worst and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future, but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last 10 years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves in the house. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir, it will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? <laughs> Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation. The last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us to submission? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir. She has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. 